I'm going to tell a story within a story, within a story, within a story, within a story, within a story. I was 12 years old, and when she asked me the question, I looked up. She said, Steve, what do you want to paint? I looked across the room, and I saw two canvases, both 24 by 36 inches. When I saw those canvases, I thought to myself, this is my chance to be an artist because, well, real artists, they paint on canvas. Now, even at the age of 12, I was quite accomplished at drawing. And I was quite accomplished at drawing because my grandfather himself was an artist. My grandfather became an artist in an ordinary but roundabout way. My grandparents are deaf. And for that reason, my grandfather, when he was younger, did not receive an education that he would have received otherwise. But a man whom he worked for as a custodian saw how tremendously accomplished he was at rendering and sent my grandfather back to school at the Kansas City Art Institute. To this day, my mom reminds me, Steve, don't forget, your grandfather had Thomas Hart Benton for a teacher. Because my grandparents were deaf, I stayed three or four days a week with them at their house. It made going to the store easier for my grandmother. When I stayed at my grandparents, I, of course, did what my grandfather did, and that is paint and draw. So that even by the age of 12, my friends would ask me to draw pictures of them and pictures of their favorite things. When she asked me what I wanted to paint, I knew that those were expensive materials. I had never been allowed to paint with canvas and oil paint before because they were so expensive. My grandfather couldn't afford to let me do that. I asked her if I could run home. I ran across the street to our house. I made my way up to the second floor, back to my room. I reached underneath my bed and I pulled out a metal white lunchbox with a Hot Wheels emblem flashing across the front. From the upper left-hand corner of one of the 16 compartments, I pulled my Demon Hot Wheel. Now, what you have to know is that previous Wednesday, I had called down to Gateway Sporting Goods on the plaza with a particular request. The woman answered the phone, and I said, Ma'am, I said, do you have any new Hot Wheels in the store this week? She set the phone down on a glass case. She came back in about a minute, and she said, Well, we've got one new car in this week. And I said, Which car is it? And she was reading from a list, I could tell. She said, we've got a demon Hot Wheel. And when she said the word demon, I could picture that car. <laughs> that car was one of eight cars lined up side by side on the back of my Hot Wheels track. Its name underneath, next to the Python, next to the Silhouette, all those cars. I had every one except for the demon Hot Wheel. The demon Hot Wheel. It was actually the car that was pictured on the front of my Hot Wheel track, jumping through the air from one red ramp to the other. When she said demon Hot Wheel, I knew that all the kids in California right then were playing with that car, but I might not ever have that chance because at that time, toys weren't distributed evenly across the United States. I ran in the kitchen. I said, Mama, I said, they've got a demon Hot Wheel. Can I go to Gateway? She said, Steve, wait till Saturday. I said, but Mom, please, if I don't go now, somebody's going to buy that car. This is my only chance. Please. She said, go. Gateway closes at 530. I went down to Gateway, and I purchased that demon Hot Wheel. And when I got it out of the store, I took it out of the box, and I held it up in the same position that it was pictured on my Hot Wheel track. You could see a little bit underneath, and you could see the profile. The only thing that bothered me about that Demon Hot Wheel was that it was burgundy, a color that I was not particularly taken with, a color that I have been faded with out of trying to buy things that are inexpensive. It actually became the color of my truck. It became the color of the bicycle that I've ridden a couple of times from Alaska. I wanted it to be day glow orange, my favorite color. <laughs> As I walked and held that car up, playing with it in my head, 
I pictured it day glow orange. And then I remembered all the mistakes I had made painting Hot Wheels before. I'd get a little bit of paint on the windshield. I'd make a mistake. I'd try to take it off with turpentine. I'd melt the windshield. <laughs> no, I wasn't going to make that mistake with possibly my only demon Hot Wheel. When she asked me what I wanted to paint, I knew what I wanted to paint. It was an image that was demanding. It was an image that I wanted to accomplish. That day, I painted my demon Hot Wheel day glow orange jumping through the air against a bright blue sky. I hung the painting to dry in my room on a white brick chimney. And because it was oil paint, it had to dry for a while. Underneath that painting on the floor, I played intently with my demon Hot Wheel. I'd get so close to it down on the floor that I could block off the view of everything else in the room and I could picture myself in that car like I was driving. Later in that summer, two new Hot Wheels were issued, replicas of Don the Snake Prudahome and Tom the Mongoose McEwen's funny cars. When I got those two Hot Wheels, I would pretend like my demon Hot Wheel was a kind of family car. I would drive the demon Hot Wheel to the drag strip, I'd climb out, I'd get in Don Prudahome's car, and I'd shoot down that drag strip 250 miles an hour, flames shooting out the headers. <laughs> I could picture in my head that image. Some years later, August 1994, I'm in Prairie Lights Bookstore with my wife who teaches seventh grade earth science. She's looking for books on volcanoes, and I'm reading books on bicycles. I come across an image in a photograph of a man with his bicycle in what looks like horribly extreme conditions. And I read the caption. The caption says, 25 below zero, the Iditarod Trail, Alaska. Already half the participants have been pulled out of the race with hypothermia. Billed as the world's toughest human-powered ultramarathon, the Iditarod bike takes place each February in the Alaskan bush. It was an image that was demanding. It was an image that I wanted to accomplish. I walked over to my wife and I set that book in her lap and I said, Lori, I said, read this. She read that and she looked at me and she said, don't even think about it. Because <laughs> it's not going to happen. Wouldn't you know, several weeks later, February 19th, 1995, I found myself laying on my back, the thermometer on my jacket buried at 30 below zero. The northern lights cascading green above me like a waterfall. The Iditarod Trail, Alaska. And I asked myself, what were you thinking when you saw that picture? <laughs> what was going through your head? Real quickly, I recovered from a moment of stupidity, and I slid my foot back into my boot. I'd taken my foot out because the tops of my toes had been rubbed raw from my sock liner. Every step that I took was painful, and I'd taken a lot of steps. I'd pushed my bicycle the past 19 miles. I'd pushed my bicycle the past 19 miles because the trail was moose-rutted. Late in February, older moose take to a firmer path. The trail was so chewed up that all I could do was push my bike. As I laid there on my back, I remembered two miles ago. I was walking and I came to the crest of a hill. I climbed on my bike thinking that I could negotiate even that moose rutted trail. when after about 150 feet, my bike slid out from underneath me. I slid about 200 yards, picking up momentum, and then thump up against a tree. And when I did, something wet sprayed across my face. And as a reflex, my tongue shot out to taste what it was. I knew that taste. I was 18 years old. 
And for the first time in my life, I actually liked my girlfriend. Now, I had had girlfriends before, but now I was paying attention to the way I looked. I was combing my hair. I was showing up on time. I was minding my manners. I was doing everything I could to impress her. And I wanted so desperately to kiss Kathy goodnight. We had gone out for three months, and I had found no way to negotiate it. But tonight, tonight was perfect. Everything was going to work out. We were going to watch TV at my house. We got to my house. I opened up the door, and my mom was sitting on the couch. Now, you can't say to your mom, Mom, do you think you could get up so Kathy and I can make out? Because that is not going to impress your girlfriend. And strategically, it would go nowhere. So I sat down on the couch. And Kathy, she sat right up next to me. And I thought, this is a start. This is good. Have you ever been on a date and you want so desperately to kiss somebody and you watch in your head every movement of your body to gauge whether or not you are headed in the right direction? The next thing I knew, we were laying side by side watching Charlie's Angels. <laughs> she smelled so good, and I didn't want to get up. This was so perfect. Everything that I wanted was right there. I wanted to be there. And then I felt on my lip what I tasted that night on the Iditarod Trail. A little bit of snot running out my nose. <laughs> now, I couldn't say, Kathy, do you think that I could get up and get a Kleenex? Because if I got up, we might not ever end up in this place again. And I had never used a Kleenex before. I believe that at any time in your life, you can say that anything that's been done to you that could have been done another way but wasn't has led to who you are in that moment. And if you're laying on the couch with somebody who you want desperately to impress and kiss goodnight for the first time and you got snot on the end of your lip, <laughs> will you feel a little bit inadequate? not up to par. Now, I believe that when you feel inadequate and not quite up to the task, well, you're more than obligated to laugh at the picture in your head of yourself. And so I laughed. But when I laughed, well, it came out. <laughs> Only it didn't just come out, it landed on the side of her face. I stood up. I was horrified. I dug my palm in the sleeve of my shirt to wipe it back. She pushed me back. I looked up. She took three swipes. Her eye was matted to her cheek. I was horrified. The situation was not supposed to turn out this way. I thought to myself, I haven't burped in front of her. I haven't farted in front of her. How could the story turn out this way? I looked to my mom for psychological relief. She was doubled up on the floor laughing. <laughs> In total humiliation, I said, Mom, I'm taking Kathy home. She said, go on, get out of here. <laughs> we drove quiet in my 68 Volkswagen, blue shag carpeting running across the dash, all the way to her house. I didn't want to ask her to pick up the pliers to turn the dial. I did not want to talk about the radio station she would tune in. I did not want to talk about anything. I was so embarrassed. And when we got to her house, well, I did what I was dutifully obligated to do. I walked her to the door. And when we got to the door, I said, have a good night. She turned and she looked at me and she said, Steve, before you leave, I want to say something. And I thought, yeah, right. My dad's already told me I'm the grossest thing on two legs. <laughs> she said, before you leave, would you kiss me goodnight? I kissed her goodnight. 
And now feeling more confident, I walked out to my Volkswagen. I raised my bottom up from the seat. I put one foot on the floorboard, the other foot against the gas pedal, and I farted until I got to the first stop sign. <laughs> As I laid on a trail that night, the northern lights cascaded green above me, and I thought, isn't that a magnificent image? Isn't that an image that's demanding? I stood up, and I began to pick up the Nutty Buddy bars that had spilled from the bags on my handlebar. I had purchased at Walmart in Iowa City 47 boxes of Nutty Buddy bars for this trip. <laughs> Strategically realizing that wafers in Nutty Buddy bars would not break your teeth like a Power Bar, a Milky Way, or a Snickers bar. Now, the rules of the race were to leave no trace of your presence. And so I had unwrapped all my Nutty Buddy bars before this race. I distributed them <laughs> in two bags that were dropped by airplane, the rest on my bicycle. As I was picking up my Nutty Buddy bars, I noticed off in the distance a light. And then all of a sudden, bright and intense, it was on me. So bright that I had to look to the ground and cover my eyes. And when I did, the voice said, Are your feet cold? Are your hands warm? How dark's your urine? Have you been drinking enough? How often do you eat? All these questions that I had asked myself the past three miles after I'd passed a man who stood in the trail, his feet too cold to walk forward, his hands too numb to turn the dial on his stove. And then click, the light went off. And when it did, a cloud of breath hovered three feet above the ground and trailed back 18 feet, at the end of which stood a kind of hero, Martin Booser, who's won the Iditarod sled dog race three times with his dog team. He said, you should make Squintina by sunup. Good luck. And he was gone. I finished picking up my Nutty Buddy bars, and as I continued down the trail walking, I concentrated in a more fuller way on eating. I was cramming into my mouth Nutty Buddy bars just to be able to get them down and wetting them down with water. I was eating Nutty Buddy bars at a rate of about one every 10 minutes when I bit down into something that was clearly different. I chomped and I swallowed, I chomped and I swallowed, I poured some water in my mouth. I swallowed harder. And I thought to myself that I had left that Snickers bar in my drop bag at Squintna. But I got it all the way down. And a horrible realization came over me when I tasted the hair at the back of my throat. I shared the Iditarod sled dog trail with sled dogs. Martin Booster's dog team had left me a treat. <laughs> I had eaten, truth be known, I had actually devoured a dog turd. <laughs> I was better than he thought. I got to squinting it before sunup. I ate the moose stew and the reindeer sausage, and I don't know if it was a mistake to keep on going, but my mind, it was rolling on its own, so I continued to pedal. I pedaled at a rate of about seven miles an hour down the Yitna River, away from Squintna. At mile 17, I rounded the corner into a kind of craziness that I've never seen before. In a heartbeat, I was torn from my bike, tossed end over end. I tried to stand up. I was knocked back down. When I crawled up on all fours, I was still tumbled over. The velocity of the wind was incredible. Even laying pancaked on my stomach, it felt as though I would be hopelessly moved. And then thump, for the second time, the wind knocked out of me as I was tossed against the bank of the river on the opposite side. The wind must have lasted no more than four minutes. And I must have sat there no more than 30 seconds, completely disoriented when my mind screamed out the question, where's your bike? I tried hopelessly to grab it, but it was impossible. 
And I said to myself, I promise, Lori, no matter what, if things got crazy, I would pull out. They're going to find me thawing out in the spring on the Yintna River. My light was wrapped by its cord around my neck, shining back into my face. I unwrapped it and plopped it back up on top of my helmet. I cast it out across the river and it caught the reflective tape on one of the bicycle bags on my bike. I stood up, I wobbled a couple of steps, I walked about 200 feet, picked up my bicycle, shook the snow off, and almost instinctually I began to pedal. And I don't know why, but for the first time I was confident. I even felt a sense of liberation that I did not have before. 20 hours later, 51 hours after the race began, I stood at the finish line and my picture was snapped. When I returned home, my dad looked at the photograph and he said, Steve, what were you thinking when they took that picture? And I said, honestly, Dad, do you remember 1970 when I had those two funny cars, the snake and the mongoose? In 1970, I played so intently with those two funny cars that when I came across an advertisement in the Kansas City Star for a job selling Cokes at the drag strip, I went to my father with the paper and I said, Dad, I said, do you think that I could get this job selling Cokes at Kansas City International Raceway? My dad looked at me and he said, Steve, Blue Springs is 23 miles from here. You are 12 years old. We don't have a car. How are you going to get that job? But my dad found a series of bus routes, and on that Thursday, I went down and I got that job. At the end of summer, on WHB radio, I heard an advertisement for the Summer Nationals to be held at Kansas City International Raceway. At the top of the ticket were Don the Snake Prudahome and Tom the Mongoose McEwen, and I was going to be there selling Cokes. That Friday, when I walked into the pits, I looked with anticipation. About 50 yards away, I saw Don Prudahome's 1970 Barracuda, Hot Wheels emblem flashing down the side. I walked over to it, and I set my coax down, and I recognized Mr. Prudahome from photographs in Hot Rod magazine. And I said, Mr. Prudhomme, do you think I could take your picture with your car? He stood up against his car, and I flashed his picture, the Hot Wheels emblem right behind him, the ball sticking off just to the right side. As I picked my coax back up, I got up enough courage to ask him the question that I'd probably wanted to ask all summer long as I played with those Hot Wheels underneath my painting of the demon. Bent over, I said, Mr. Prudahome, do you think that you would take a picture of me inside your car like I was driving? His mechanic looked at me. I could see that he'd never been asked this question before. <laughs> he shrugged his shoulders and looked at Don Prudahome. And Don Prudhomme said, why not? I handed Don Prudhomme my grandfather's camera, and I sat in a seat. The mechanic buckled both buckles. I reached up, and I grabbed a steering wheel. They lowered that yellow Barracuda body onto the car so that now I was looking out the window across the blower of Don Prudhomme's snake. He backed up to get the full picture in. And as he snapped my picture, 
I could picture myself shooting down the drag strip 250 miles an hour, just like the picture in my head. A long time ago, I had learned a lesson from a hidden teacher. If you pay attention to the pictures in your head, you will always ask yourself the question, what was I thinking? And when you ask that question, you will always be in the right place. I was 12 years old, and I looked up when the door shut. He said, don't get up. What were you thinking? How many times do I have to ask you that question, Steve? What were you thinking? I knew that my dad was not interested in what I was thinking. I knew that if I said anything at all, I'd be in more trouble than I was worth. So I kept my mouth shut. But what my dad didn't realize is that I had the whole two hours that I had sat there ask myself what I was thinking. And this is what I was thinking. One month before, I had gone to my father with a special request and the Montgomery Ward catalog. I set it in his lap and I said, Dad, I said, do you think that I could get this bicycle? I pointed to a purple bicycle, high handlebars, high sissy bar, chrome fender, chrome chain guard, five speed, shocks on the rear, shocks on the front. When I saw the bicycle in the catalog, I could, as I imagined myself being on it, almost taste what it looked like to be with. I was so taken with that bicycle. My dad looked at me and my dad said, how many times do I have to tell you? The answer is no. We've talked about this before. I said, but dad, everybody's got a banana seat bike. He said, guess what, Steve? I'm happy for everyone, but you can't have one. If you want a bicycle, get one with low handlebars. I said, but dad, my dad's logic was this. If I were to have a wreck on a bicycle with high handlebars, I might suddenly be thrust forward and stuck in those handlebars and so be hurt worse otherwise. He said, no, you can't have, Steve, a bicycle with high handlebars. <laughs> this logic surprised me because it came from a man whom, when I was 10 years old, did this. When I was 10 years old, I was, like most kids, taken up with the adventure of jumping. I began in a really ordinary way by leaping from the front porch of the apartment building on the first floor where we lived out into the yard. As June rolled around, I had gained confidence through practice and made my way up to the second floor where I hung off the landing and dropped out into the bushes. After about a week of doing that, I was confident enough that I was standing on the ledge of the second floor porch jumping out into the yard. And then in August, my sister finally gave in to her terror that morning and she ran into the house and she said, Mom, Steve's on Mrs. Brown's porch. He's going to jump off. My mom came outside and she looked at me and she said, Sean, Stephen, you get your butt down here right now. Now she knew that she could not get me off that porch. So she called in the house and she said, Mick, come out here. He came outside and he looked up saw me on the third floor and said, Steve, listen, if you decide to jump, make sure you roll when you hit the ground. I jumped, I rolled, and I made it. I could not understand my dad's logic. Bicycles with high handlebars are too dangerous. I went to my mom and my mom went to my dad, and my dad came back to me with a compromise. He said, listen, Steve, I'll tell you what. I talked with your mom. She thinks you should have that bike. You can have that bike, but you have to pay for it with your own money. Listen, you want to kill yourself? Hey, fine with me. Do it with your own money. <laughs> so that's what I did. And I went with my mom in my grandfather's car to the Montgomery Ward St. Joseph Outlet Store. 
I knew where Sporting Goods was. I rounded the corner at the top of the escalator and I stopped because I saw that bicycle and I knew that any second I was actually going to touch what I wanted so bad. It's kind of like when you've got a crush on somebody and you've had it for months and you've pictured yourself kissing this person and then as far from foreseeable as it was back when that crush began, the day comes when you're standing there ready to kiss this person and you stop because you're not sure but what the picture in your head that you've been building up is better than what's about ready to happen. I climbed on that bicycle and I rolled it up to the counter. I love that bicycle. My mom took the $79 from her envelope. We rolled it out to my grandfather's car and we drove home. The first two weeks I had that bicycle, all I did was ride sun up to sun down. You could see me cresting the hill. I have for my whole life made sounds on my bike as I crested the hill. Does anybody make sounds when they ride their bike or do stuff like that? I kid you not. I, was, I told my wife I was so embarrassed what happened the other day. It was about 8 degrees and I was coming down to Sharon Blacktop. And it was a little bit icy out and I was flying on my bicycle. And out of being just a little bit scared that I was going to lose control, on my speedometer I was going 31 miles an hour. All of a sudden I was boom! <laughs> and I look up and there's a guy getting mail out of his mailbox. And he watched the whole time. And I was making loud sounds. <laughs> now, I believe that when you get a picture in your head, you want more than anything else to accomplish that image. Images are demanding. I picture myself so fast. Fastest thing on two wheels. I can see the headlines on the paper. Boy rides bicycle 200 miles an hour. I found a toggle switch. I duct taped that toggle switch to the frame of my bicycle. And on a Friday afternoon after school, went out riding. And I waited for the first car. I heard a car coming. I turned back and looked over my shoulder. I saw Mr. Timbrook's Galaxy 500 crest the hill. When he got alongside of me, he waved. And I waited for him to pass. And then I reached forward. And I moved that toggle switch from the off to the on position. I started to shake. I pedaled so furiously to the stop sign. In my head, I was incredibly fast. Now, like I said, when you get a picture in your head, you want more than anything else to make that real. And you gradually but constantly work toward accomplishing that image. The following weekend, I was downstairs folding clothes next to the washing machine. And stacked against it were magazines, the top magazine Hot Rod. And on the cover Hot Rod was Don Prudhomme's car. Smoke billowing out the back, flames shooting out the side. Blah, 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 blah. When I saw that picture, I thought to myself, wouldn't that be something? if a guy could do that on his bicycle. Wouldn't that be something? <laughs> now, I knew that I did not have in my legs enough torque to turn wheels on my bicycle fast enough to ignite bleach, which is what funny cars do. I was going to need a little bit of help. When my brother got up, I asked him to help me. We walked out to the shed, and I held out a mason jar, and I said, pour some in. He said, pour some what in? I said, pour some gas in. He said, we're going to get in trouble. I said, just pour it in. Nobody's up yet. It's 615. He filled the jar about a quarter of the way up. I handed it to him. I grabbed my bicycle. I walked it through the gate, through the front yard, and he followed. I stood on my bicycle, and I said, go ahead. He said, go ahead, what? <laughs> and I said, pour it on the back tire. <laughs> I was consumed with this image, and I had left out all the stages that were necessary to accomplish this feat. I knew what needed to happen. He was just needing to follow my instructions. I said, pour some on the back tire. He poured it on the back tire, and I watched it trickle through the tread till it hit the pavement and pull out. I said, do it on the front, too. 
He did it on the front, and then I dug deep in my pocket for my dad's lighter. Reached back, and I lit them tires, and the flames shot around on the back. I lit the front tire, flames danced around the tread. And I looked at myself on that bike, and I thought, this is cool. I rode for about 15 feet before the flames were extinguished. But the image in my head was wonderful. It was magnificent. And I wanted it bad. So we repeated everything in front of my grandfather's camera, my brother taking pictures. I rode past on my bike, action photos. He snapped my picture. Now, up to this point in my life, even though I had gotten a billfold from a previous Christmas, I had never, ever carried it. But when I got that photograph developed, I carried my billfold. I'd go up to my friends and I'd say, hey, check it out. Fastest thing on two wheels, flaming tires. <laughs> and there I was, all smiles and flames shooting down the street. <laughs> the image was magnificent. Now, I believe that when you get a picture in your head, you want more than anything else to accomplish it. The following weekend, I was downstairs folding clothes when I, for the first time, realized the potential of an old oak door that had sat there for the longest time doing nothing. When my brother got up, I asked him to help me. We carried it down the street, around the corner to the dead end, where I propped it up against a 55-gallon trash barrel, pushed both up against a guardrail, and I rode my bicycle to the opposite corner. When I got to the opposite end of the street, I looked down and I saw that door. And then fear came over me. And I could feel that tingle in my hands, the tingle that I would feel hanging off that third floor. I saw that little bit of glitch in between the pavement and the door, and I knew that if I hit it wrong, well, I'd wreck. And then I heard Mike Timbrook's door open. And not wanting to appear a coward, I nonchalantly just moved away from the position that I had assumed. Gradually, all 19 kids in the neighborhood were out. Some riding, some walking, all with the same look on their face. I know I'm not going to do it. And then for the briefest of seconds, I caught myself looking down the street at that door. And I saw that everybody was looking at me. And then I did, out of a sense of obligation, what my dad said I was so good at. I suspended brain one, and I pedaled furiously down the street. And when I hit that door, just like the picture in my head, my front wheel headed for the side. I straightened it out. I went up over the door. My feet came down before my bike, but I made it, and I was good. I turned around, and with confidence bordering on fear, I pedaled to the opposite end of the street, knowing that if I stopped, I might not ever do it again. Without looking up, I pedaled as fast as I could back down to the door, and I looked at the door right as I approached it. As I went up, I concentrated as hard as I could to keep my feet on the pedals. I pushed down, and because I did, I skipped the guardrail, but I made it. Now, feeling more confident, I turned my bicycle around for a third pass shot down the street, and just like the hood ornament on Mr. Timbrook's Galaxy 500, I took the position of a swan dive, arched my chest forward, tippy toes up on the pedal, shot up through the air, came down, dirt, just like action movies shooting out behind cars, shot up in the air, and I thought, I'm good. <laughs> Turned my bicycle around for a fourth pass. In a kind of strutting way, I rode to the opposite end, one pedal jerk, two pedal jerks. And then I heard the sound of the door of the woman who notoriously called the police on us. I looked in the direction of her house, and I saw nobody. I turned back down the street, and I could not believe what I saw. My brother was standing on the left-hand side of the door with a five-gallon can of gas. <laughs> He walked around the door, pouring. He backed up and got everybody to move. 
and with stick matches lit it. Flames shot up above my head. All the kids lined up on both sides. And when they saw that I saw this picture, they all began to say the same thing. Do it, do it, do it. <laughs> and I thought to myself, you know what? I could do this. And then just that quick, I saw him coming out the side of my eye. He said, son, you stop right there. <laughs> now, I do believe that when the police said stop, I was going to stop. But a picture, a magnificent image came to my head. It was from Steve McQueen's movie, The Great Escape. He's in occupied France. It's World War II. Nazis are coming up over the hill. They're drawing their guns to their shoulder. They're almost within firing range. He looks off in the horizon. He sees a spool of razor wire separating him from freedom. Rumpf, rumpf. He revs his motorcycle. Looks back over his shoulder. Drops the clutch. Wheel spins around. Turf shoots up in the air. He does a loop, and then up over he goes, and he's free. I didn't have an engine on my bike. I turned my grip on my handlebar. Shot down the street as fast as I could, and because the door was on fire, it was weak. It collapsed, and I drove that 55-gallon trash barrel into that guardrail. And I laid there, charbroiled. <laughs> Next thing I knew, I felt his arm reach down, grasp my elbow, whip me up, and as I spun up and around, I looked for everybody, nobody in sight. <laughs> and then real terror came over my body because I realized at that moment, at my house, my mom, against all my father's teasing, was having a Tupperware party. Uh -huh. He walked me up to our house, he knocked on the door, and the room opened to women, half of whom were my friend's moms, all of whom had that same look on their face. I told you, Betty, he's headed straight for hell. <laughs> she was so embarrassed, she just looked at me like, follow me. I followed her. She didn't turn around to see the looks on all those women's face. She knew what they thought. She took me to my room, she set me down, she said, wait till your father gets home. And when my father got home, what did he say? What were you thinking? How many times, Steve, do I have to ask you that question? I tell you that because on April 22, 1993, I just finished eating my lunch in North Hall at the university, and I was walking down past the Laser Research Center when a van pulled up. And a woman who's a reporter, she leaned over to the side, rolled down the window. She said, are you Steve McGuire? I said, yeah. She said, what were you thinking? What was going through your head? And like back then, I hadn't thought about it much. She said, can I talk to you? I said, sure. She said, do you think that we could go down to the river? When we got down to the river, I remembered the day before. I had just finished eating lunch in the Iowa Memorial Union. And I started up the concrete staircase to the footbridge that crosses the river to go to the art building. When I looked up and noticed everyone lined up against the south railing. And I thought to myself, somebody's doing something stupid and they're looking for an audience. I'm not going to be that audience. I'm going to keep on walking. I walked across the bridge. And as I descended the staircase, I turned to a woman I teach with. And I said, Ann, what's everybody looking at? Hoping that she would tell me that I could still walk on, having been better not getting sucked in to this stupid stunt. She said, Steve, somebody's in the water. I walked back up onto the bridge. And I peered over the shoulder of a man. And if the man's head in the water would have been painted red and white, he'd have looked appropriate. Just like a bobber, up and down, appearing and then disappearing, there and then gone. The next thing I knew, I could feel everything in my stomach coming up. I was running so fast along the west bank of the river. When I got up to the railroad bridge, I looked out over the river, and he wasn't coming to my side. 
I ran as fast as I could across the railroad tracks. And when I got to the other side, I slid down the gravel embankment. And right when I hit the water, right as I contemplated what to do, of all things I should remember, I remembered this. When I was seven years old, there was a hill nearly two miles long, so steep that at the end I would have to get off my bicycle and push the last bit. But when I get to the top, I turn my bicycle around, I'd start down the hill, and after about 150 feet, I'd let go with one hand, but I'd watch my front wheel because I knew if I hit even the smallest pebble, it would wobble and maybe go out of control and I'd crash. Faster yet, I'd let go with both hands. Faster still, I'd open up my arms just like I was flying. And then I'd lean back to that precarious place where you know if you lean any further back, you're going to crash. Then I put one foot up on my handlebars then two feet up on my handlebars. And then I'd shoot down that street as fast as I could. I didn't pay any attention to the cars that were passing me, and I didn't pay any attention to the people on the sidewalk that I flew by. It felt so good. It felt just like I was flying. I could see the image in my head, and sometimes that picture lasted forever. From that, I played another game for the rest of my life. It goes like this. There's a concrete staircase, and next to that concrete staircase is a concrete slab. Looks just like a ramp, and next to that is grass. You got three choices and one rule. The rule is you have to pedal as fast as you can. The choices are either give up and go to the grass, crash into the stairs, or have faith and go up that slab. Not once did I crash, not once did I give up, and every time, just like the picture in my head, I shot right up that concrete slab. When I hit the water that day, <gasps> so cold I could feel the wind sucked out of me. He went under two more times. And then right when I got to him, I reached out and he was gone. Flat water is all I saw. The picture in my head at that moment was of me laying in bed for the next several years of my life saying, how could this ever happen to me? I missed him. I went after him. He's dead and I missed him. Just that quick, I made a pass underneath the water, and I felt the collar of a wool trench coat. I tugged, and he came free from the branches of a tree that had lodged itself in the middle of the river. Already in 93, the river had begun to flood. It was cordoned off with orange mesh fence, signs posted to stay clear. I gasped for air, and I kicked and tried to reach higher up on that tree to pull myself up out of the water. After four tries, I straddled the branch and I sat up on it like I was sitting on a horse. And then I turned him around. Water ran over his shoulder to make a wake. His chin just three inches above the surface. It reminded me of one of the spookiest things that I've ever seen. I had gone home on November 3rd, 1992 with the intention of listening to the election results on the radio. I sat there waiting for the results. And then I realized the dogs had not come back, which was unusual because I fed them when I came home. I opened up the door and I looked out and I could see him off in Henry Zook's field. And I called him. I said, John Henry, Sweepy, come. Sweepy, she came on a dead run. But John Henry, he just sat there. So I kneeled down on one knee. And I said, John Henry, come. He stood up, he staggered, and he fell over. I ran down there. His stomach was completely distended, full of fluid, like he had swallowed a basketball. I picked him up and I ran up to my truck and I put him in the cab and I drove as fast as I could to Iowa City. As we drove, he would slide out of the seat into the floorboard. And I held his head up and I kept looking him in the eyes and I kept saying, John Henry, buddy, you're going to make it. You're not going to die. But his eyes kept telling me the same story. Steve, this is it. I'm going to die. What do I do? That man 
looked the same way. He looked like he thought he should be dead. He looked like he belonged underneath the water. We pushed off from that tree and we made it to the bank right at the Iowa Avenue Bridge. We were helped out of the river by everyone lined up, escorted to one or two ambulances. We sat in the ambulance wrapped in hypothermic blankets for what seemed like a long time, nobody saying a word. And then finally, he looked up at me and you know what he asked me? What were you thinking when you saw me in the water? I did not think the story would turn out this way. As I walked away from the ambulance that afternoon back to my office, dripping wet, I remembered what was going through my head, the image that was demanding. As I ran across that railroad track, I pictured myself calling my dad that night from home and telling my dad, what I was thinking. I knew that my dad would love this story.